Welcome to All About Money on HKIBC. I'm Chloe Fong. Hong Kong is striving to become a regional green finance hub as it tries to get a piece of the 2.7 trillion US dollar market. As the city transitions into a low carbon economy, local experts warned of potential drags. And this includes a lack of clarity on regulations, inconsistent ESG disclosures by listed companies, and the absence of a clear blueprint. A recent report jointly published by an international law firm and a Hong Kong-based sustainability consultancy has outlined the needs for investors and how the legal industry can do its part. So joining us today are the report's co-authors Penelope Shen and Zi Wei An from Stevenson Harwood. So welcome to our show. On this recent report, is actually highlighted that all of the interviewees, because your research actually have the interviews with 26 executives uh, from different companies, and all of them highlighted they want to do it. But it's a matter of how do we do it to fulfill the ESG practices. And one of the biggest drags to the city's efforts in transitioning to a low carbon economy is the lack of clear definitions about ESG and sustainability. And even now, when we talk about these two, even including me, I'm still confused about these two. So could you also tell us about the clear difference? What are the major differences between the two? Sure, uh, I can give it a go first. So indeed, it is a key feedback from our stakeholders that confusion amongst the of all the different terms is a hin, hin, hindrance. Um, but in our report, you see that we are not really trying to define ESG and sustainability per se, but to um, point out that when people use these terms, um, they may be talking about different things and you need to find out what they're talking about. And oftentimes ESG, especially in the investment space uh, today, may be considered as a strategy that mainly looks at the, um, the risks uh, for the companies and the uh, investors. Whereas sustainability um, will be referring to an investment approach or mindset that um, will look at the relationship between a company and the environment and people in a more interactive and holistic way. Um, so for example, if you are uh, a garment manufacturer, you may have a factory um, in, a, in a community where if you do not properly treat the dye that comes from uh, your garment, mm. um, you may pollute the local river and it may impact the local livelihood, which may in turn impact uh, the workforce uh, for your uh, factory and the long-term sustainability of your business. So when we want to uh, uh, make a distinction between the two, we are really wanting to highlight the latter as uh, the trend that we are seeing globally, um, sustainability uh, as a systemic way of looking about at the, um, at the impact of a company. Hmm. What about you, Penny? Um, from my perspective, I like to look at it uh, 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 in the more simplistic term. To me, sustainability is what we do that would impact the rest of the world. Hmm. And ESG investment, on the other hand, is what the world is impacting us. So taking another example um, that I recently heard, which I thought was really, really good, is that Hong Kong is full of property development, so many property developers, right? So if, if you are a property developer, um, looking at how ESG should, um, how sustainability affect your business, is that, okay, you can ignore all that that's happening, um, don't consider ESG risks, but if you build a building now and do not consider ESG at all, um, in 10 years, you might not have any tenant because um, because that's what everyone is looking at. So the, the, the two are actually interrelated. You can see how you impact the world at the same time. If you ignore it, it will come back and bite you. So I think they are different, but at the same time, they should be looked at together. So those without ESG practices may not be able to cope with new trends later on, maybe in 10 years, 20 years, because people want to have those kind of practices to be incorporated in their products. That's right. And uh, greenwashing, however, is also on the rise, because when we're talking about how popularity of the ESG concept and how we should incorporate it into our products, there are some trends that is also hindering such efforts because, for example, greenwashing, it refers to the act of making unsubstantiated claims about the environmental benefits of a product or a practice. Uh, how would you rate such practice prevalence in Hong Kong? Is it very prevalent or, and how do we also reduce such acts? Um, I think this is a global phenomenon. Um, I think every regulator in the world is tackling this issue because while you know green 
going green is inevitable. A lot of people could be, they don't know what to do, they want to sell their products, so they want to put in big jargon saying that, you know, they, they are green. So um, it, it's not, it, it's, a, it's, it's not a Hong Kong issue. It's a global issue. So regulators are definitely looking at it. Uh, for example, um, from actually from the invest uh, from the companies that are rolling out products, there's a huge reputational risk. If you look at the uh, green bond market, if you have rolled out a green bond that's actually not green, the chances of people will buy your bond again later will be substantially minimized. Um, also, uh, there are, you might have also heard there are a lot of labeling. I'm an investment funds lawyer. There are a lot of funds labeling um, at the same time, maybe scooping back closer to Hong Kong. Hong Kong has this um, ESG fund. Uh, so. For example, what SFC is doing when um, an asset manager is looking to set up an ESG fund, you have to satisfy certain criteria. And when they are actually approving the product, they actually will ask you, you know, how do you substantiate your claim that this is actually an ESG fund? Um, so regulators are trying to do it. And, but again, you know, the whole, I, I think what we have to emphasize is the transition journey uh, is, is it's not just for the investor or the stakeholder. Everyone is involved. Everyone is kind of going through this journey together. So uh, that's, a, that's my view. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, maybe just uh, adding a little bit. So greenwashing is also quite complex in the sense that it can happen in many different ways. So it can be a company um, overclaiming its green efforts. Um, but it can also be an investor thinking that its investment strategy is really green, um, but because of lack of good data or lack of good uh, monitoring of what's happening, uh, greenwashing happen as a result. So. Um, you can see um, this ties closely to then the standard um, and quality of good data in disclosure. And therefore, you see that a lot of international efforts are actually in strengthening disclosure, um, in emphasizing transparency. And as lawyers, I think um, it is also part of our role to work with our clients to uh, ask the right questions so we get the right information. Mm, and also about drafting the agreements like between different companies as well to enhance such efforts, isn't it? So it's about the quality in the information when it comes to the uh, climate-related disclosures. And your report also pointed out that we have the insufficient and inconsistent disclosures in the ESG practice by the companies as well, especially by the listed companies when the Hong Kong Stock Exchange actually have such requirements. So would you say that now it's more about the regulations or the enforcement now. So previously we we're trying to incentivize the companies to incorporate such ESG practices into their investment, into their products. But when, for example, those companies who are not really disclosing enough are not being, let's say, having the accountability, then what should authorities do to also enhance uh, this kind of efforts as well? I come from an uh, uh, asset management kind of background, so maybe I'll focus on, on that front. Uh, the SSC rolled out the climate risk disclosure um, requirements last year. Uh, uh, all the asset managers now have to make the disclosure on their um, climate risks um, if they are running the fund. So on that, you know, I, I know we said in our report some, some of the stakeholders feel that there's not enough en enforcement action. But the thing is, you know, if, if the regulators start, you know, finding everyone in the first year while actually a lot of people are giving feedback that they don't know what they're doing, I, I think you have, we, you will push the entire market away. So The counter effect. The, exactly. So I, I'm sure that's not what, what we want and, and uh, not the regulators want. So I think it takes time. But if you look at the global trend, as for example, in the US and the UK, like there are quite a few cases in Australia at the moment, um, there are more and more enforcement actions. Um, going on in the world. So as everyone progresses, I think that will be the trend if you continue to violate those requirements. So they're both important. I think they go hand in hand. Mm. What yeah. about you, your thought? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with Penny. Um, it is a journey. And um, if you just look at the regulations, um, ESG reporting in Hong Kong since it was launched in 2013, it has gradually gone from voluntary to uh, comply or explain to now you have parts on the board governance side that's mandatory. So you see that as a global trend and increasingly international uh, regulations are also having uh, extraterritorial uh, uh, jurisdiction, long-arm jurisdiction. So, um, 
which I understand my colleagues will explain a little bit more. So European regulations may impact Asian-based uh, businesses as well. So um, that is the trend. And so um, as a company, uh, you, you would have to gradually improve. It's not about getting there in one day, but it's um, being uh, conscious, intentional about your learning and um, having the right uh, information and working with the right uh, experts to get yourself there. Yeah. So it's still by large also from the company's motivation itself as well to do things out of goodwill. Um, maybe I, <laughs> yeah. All right. yeah, I, think, I think it is um, not, not just goodwill yes. um, because um, the global, when you talk about regulation, you, you, you talk about it as being like one of the drivers, right? Um, but actually, uh, there are other things that are quickly changing, including uh, like consumer expectations, market expectations. And I think more and more companies are also seeing that ESG or sustainability factors um, is a real um, risk if they don't consider them properly. Um, it is also opportunities because uh, with the transition to low carbon economy, uh, there are also a lot of opportunities if you um, jump in now and, and take these uh, factors seriously, yeah. Right, now it's also interesting because it turns out that more consumers are willing to buy products that with the ESG or climate benefits concerns. So this is definitely a trend as well. But last but not least, I want to also point out about the your report saying that Hong Kong is, is lacking a clear roadmap for the city to transition into the low carbon economy. But actually Hong Kong has several different kind of plans for, for example, for waste charging, for the EV installations, things like that. But what do you mean by the city is lacking this kind of like clear roadmap? How detailed should we like address uh, when it comes to different kind of practices in various sectors, and you also mentioned about China has some policy that we can also refer to. So could you tell us more about that? Okay, so maybe I'll go first. Okay, so, so first of all, um, the, the report has, going back to our report, um, some of the stakeholders did say they, they feel that Hong Kong doesn't have a clear roadmap. And um, for those who have not read the report, then we actually substantiated while the stakeholder felt that Hong Kong is, doesn't seem to be doing enough, um, Hong Kong actually has rolled out the climate action plan. Right. And there are actually specific targets. Um, for example, uh, one of the targets is reducing carbon intensity by 65 to 70 percent by 2030. Um, that means about um, 26 to 36 carbon um, by the time. And we are also planning to spend $240 billion um, to, on mitigation and adaptation on different areas like green transport, as you said, um, waste reduction, et cetera. So there the, are the things happening. So, um, but, but for the purpose of our report, we basically reflect how maybe it's a marketing thing. Uh, the Hong Kong government could spend more on marketing um, to let everyone know what, what our action plan are, but they are there. The, the Hong Kong government is definitely doing a lot. Hmm. What about Z Wei? Yeah, I, I, I think um, definitely um, we can see Hong Kong government taking a lot of actions in the last few years. Um, as a citizen, I, I, I do think maybe on the climate side, maybe it is marketing how we can we as a as a as a city know better the climate uh, risks that we are facing and and what are the clim different climate scenarios and also how can we be better prepared for these risks so i think um, this is also going to be uh, important uh, as we go forward yeah Right, and also when it, uh, when it comes to the report that your company published, it's also saying that uh, China has more detailed specific plans for different industries to hit those environmental targets. So maybe that is also one of the ways that we can look into in the future. So thank you very much for your insights, both. So that's a wrap for this section. Coming up next, we'll switch our focus to the global shipping industry and discuss how Hong Kong, as one of the busiest container ports in the world, can also adapt to new regulations and standards to cut carbon emissions, so do stay tuned.